I am pleased to have a longtime favorite, first time guest in Andy Staples, who hosts a daily show over on On3 at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Andy, you are a much better man than me doing a morning radio show because I once did a morning radio show and I never want to do it again. So thank you so much for taking time this afternoon to talk with us. I am learning to become a morning person, RJ. I, I was the fill-in guy at Sirius XM for eight years, so I would bounce from like the morning show to the midday to the afternoon, and I always hated that morning. You get up so early, and it's like, what are we doing? Am I supposed? I have to have energy now. But now that it is every day, I figure I, I, I have actually figured it out, and it's, and this idea of having because I've been you know I, I started as a purely a sports writer, so my schedule was going into midnight, like you stop working at midnight, basically. And this idea of afternoons and evenings actually being able to do things, it's very foreign to me, but I kind of like it. I kind of see what you're getting at. But as a man who still does most of his writing at 2.30 in the morning, it's just not going to, it's not, it's not going to be my deal. It's not going to be my deal. Plus to the sports writer point, we cover games at night, right? And I'm thinking about it from the standpoint of what big games are coming on the this uh, this season, and how many of those games are stacked throughout the day? Like we got Big Noon at Fox. Yeah, we we got to thank Fox for giving us Big Noon, the gift of Big Noon. Because hey, remember what noon college football used to be? It's like you got the end of game day, so they just uh, like Lee Corso's just put the head. I now realize I'm talking about another network, but this but this was before your excellent pregame show on Fox had even started. So you know the 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 head goes on. And then all of a sudden, you go to a very sleepy Ryan Field in Evanston, Illinois, where Illinois and and Northwestern are about to kick it off in front of friends and family and even the announcer sound board. But now we get big noon. So now we're going to get one of the biggest games in the country on Fox at noon. And the competition has tried to counter program. So we actually have multiple good games at yes. noon, Yes, which that I is, appreciate as that, an old man. That's what, man, look, at Oklahoma, it was always a thing, right? Because at Oklahoma, <laughs> that's at that 11 a.m. kickoff, which means that oh, we yeah. didn't do any tailgating. And we've been driving up, if you're coming from, say, Tulsa, which is two and a half, two hours to Norman, you're up at about five, right, for an 11 a.m. kick. You want a 2.30 game, right? That's what you want. That's what everybody seems to want if they're going to games. But what I have to remind people is that these games are not played in front of 84,000 people alone. They're played in sometimes, if you're Colorado, 10 million people. <laughs> and if you can capture 10 million people at 11 a.m., you get that. Then what we had with CBS and the SEC, I'm curious to see how that goes, get your take on that. And then, of course, we get our nightcaps later on. But I brought up Big Noon because Texas-Michigan is on the schedule this year, right? And for the first time mm -hmm. in three years, Michigan got to play somebody in a non-conference. And I'm curious, off top, do you think that Steve Sarkeesian is right with his assessment? Because it kind of terrifies me because I can't see the flaw in the logic. We're Georgia – before Georgia became Georgia. I I think that's a pretty accurate sentiment. Uh, now, I, I, I probably need to see them develop a few more generations of D linemen, but Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat, mm -hmm. going from what they were to what they became, is pretty good proof of concept. Now, Bo Davis, the, the guy who did it, has gone off to LSU. Right. But if you look at Sark, because my biggest issue with Texas – over the last decade was you, you lose games. You're not supposed to lose. You know, you, you kind of sleepwalk through some and, and you get beat when you're not supposed to get beat and you don't make NFL players anymore. Well, they just had 11 guys drafted and it wasn't smoke and mirrors. They're legit dudes. Kelvin banks, their left tackle is going to be a first round draft pick next year. DJ Campbell, who's in that same class who's starting at guard. Now he's an NFL guy. Uh, you know, you look across the field, they've got dudes everywhere now and so i don't worry about it. like they have fixed the problems that caused me the concerns about texas i i'd really go into the season looking at them like yeah you should compete for the national title you should compete for the sec title and like going to michigan this is a great first test michigan's got a lot of talent but they also have a lot of holes to fill they have a lot of of, of spots to to make up, you know, they're going to put inexperienced guys like like their offensive line. I'm not worried about Michigan's offensive line. Ultimately, I think it's going to be good. I think they're going to be able to run the ball very effectively because they've recruited well. And Sharon Moore has done a great job building and having depth on that offensive line. So those guys are going to be fine. 
but they are going to be very early in their time as contributors when they're playing the Texas Longhorns, who are quite a bit more experienced. Like, even though you lose Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat, Alfred Collins and Malcolm Broughton were playing a bunch. So they're going to be fra- – like, they're going to know what they're doing want, and be very accustomed to dealing with dudes like you're going to be sending at them. I'm going to jump in there real quick because Alfred Collins is that dude that – could not give me a good three-point stance to save his life out of high school, and he's developed into a dude. And then Vernon Broughton has looked the part forever, forever. And then, you know, Pete Krakowski, that's the underrated part for me, is they have four years of continuity on the coaching staff, save, uh, I believe, their uh, offensive line coach, right? Jeff Choate's over at Nevada. So you well, got, no, no. Jeff Choate was a linebackers coach. Kyle linebacker. Flood is the O line coach, uh, former Rutgers coach. There but yeah, go. and then they, they lost Bo Davis to LSU. But again, I, I do think... Like, because you always wonder with these guys who go through the Nick Saban rehabilitation program, like, what do they take from Saban? Do they take the right things? Or even the ones who didn't go through the, the, I got fired and then I went through it. Like Jeremy Pruitt, who came up through the Saban system, didn't take the right things from Nick Saban. Sark seems to have taken... You know, exactly. like, like I've got yeah. to say, he's got as many hits as he's got misses on that one. Yeah. So it's real hard but to Sark seems down. to have taken all the right things. Mm. He seems to understand. Now, a lot of it is just at this point taking the right Alabama players mm. like Isaiah Bond and, and Amari Nyblack, I think are going to fit right into that offense. Like Nyblack, if you were looking for somebody to replace Jatavian Sanders physically, that's the perfect person. They have been so terribly blessed at that position at tight end in ways that I think are undersold because they've been so dynamic at wide receiver, right? Like they can do most of what they want. And then backfield, you happen upon a Jonathan Brooks when you expect CJ Baxter to be the guy. But the question that I think that many people want answered is, is Quinn Ewers going to be healthy for the entire year? Or are we going to get the Arch Manning experience and we're going to call that dude, not Quinn Ewers, but uh, Wally Pip? So... Quinn Ewers has not been healthy for an entire season in his two seasons as a starter. Cool. Cool. So I have no reason in, in, in a season that you expect if you're Texas to go 16 or 17 games. Mm. Like, are we, are we sure he's going to be healthy? Probably not. But guess what? You got one of the best backups in the country. And yeah, I, I am curious if Arch does wind up coming in, would he wind up staying in? Because last year you had Malik come in and, they almost lost to Kansas State, mm-hmm. and that is the danger when you have a backup quarterback in the game. You know, the year before they had to play Hudson Card. I think they feel a lot more comfortable now if they've got to play Arch if if Quinn gets hurt. But yeah, I I, I am curious what happens if if we do get a taste of Arch because I got to be honest, Quinn's the one part of this whole thing that I'm not entirely sold on. That Same that way. was the reason when. When I was picking the Sugar Bowl last year, I picked Washington to win because I had more faith in Michael Penix Jr. than I had in Quinn. Mm. And I'm not saying Quinn's a bad quarterback. I'm just saying the level you've got to play at to win a national championship is extremely high. The bar is high, and you're going to be playing against some really good dudes. And so is he going to take that next step? Is he going to become like a first round draft pick at quarterback, which he certainly has all the tools for. He has the arm talent, but can he put it all together and can he stay healthy to your point? Because it hasn't happened yet. I don't doubt the talent. I don't think any of us have ever doubted the talent. That's why he's a number one overall recruit at the time. Right. And he's able to go to Ohio state, take advantage of that deal, come back home. Then you get another number one and a guy who is a wet dream for coaches and old donors alike. I don't want anything. Don't even put me in the video game that everybody wanted to be (laughs) in because I don't care. All I want to do is play ball. My question going into the spring was, can that dude actually play? Because, you know, no disrespect to Isidore Newman or any of the folks that do the very hard work of giving a rating, right? Scouting talent. But I watched that dude at Texas in the spring game, and I said, oh, no. He's as good as they say he is, or at least in that setting he is. So I, I no longer doubt his talent. So if you're Quinn Ewers, and you know that's behind you, this is probably your best shot to A, go win a national championship, probably your last shot, and you're doing everything you can to stay healthy. I'm also asking this question. I'm asking earnestly. If you're Steve Sarkeesian, what are the questions that you need to answer if Arch says, 
why am I not playing? If he ever changes that tune, I don't expect him to because it seems like his granddaddy's running that whole operation over there and they they're, they got the company line. But do you yeah. ever wonder what if he changes his mind? I don't because okay. they've they've been so steadfast and all of his actions have suggested that he's cool with this. And remember, most quarterbacks who were that level of recruit would not be cool with this. They would have bounced in the transfer portal already. This was clearly the plan all along. And it's interesting because a lot of, and, and you know, you, you cover enough quarterbacks and you understand kind of where they're coming from. Like raising a quarterback is exceptionally expensive mm. in terms of money, in terms of resources, in terms of time. So if you're a parent who has raised a quarterback who wound up getting a D1 scholarship, you are getting a little antsy mm. when you don't necessarily see the path to the starting job within a year or so. The Mannings aren't going to feel that way. They don't have to worry about that. And not just the money piece of it, but Archie's been an NFL quarterback. Peyton's been an NFL quarterback. Eli's been an NFL quarterback. Cooper has seen all this up close. They understand not starting at Texas this year will not keep Arch from becoming an NFL quarterback. It won't change anything for him on that front. If he's going to be one, he's going to be one. And so I think that's why you've seen this measured approach that you really don't see from most quarterbacks who were recruited at that level. You do see it some. Like Carson Beck at Georgia is a good example. He didn't start until year four at Georgia. But most quarterbacks, because they've put in all this time, their parents have put in all this money, they're just they're looking for the spot to play right now. If you like what you've seen, consider subscribing to the number one college football show on YouTube, the Fox Sports app, or wherever you get your podcast.